Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet each of you. Um, good to have you here. <clears throat> We're gonna have a fairly intense two days. Uh, a lot of what I may present may surprise you, and you may wonder, what in the heck does this have to do with genetics? But I assure you that everything that I present has an awful lot to do with genetics and ultimately what happens with the livestock, the plants, the microorganisms, the entire microbiome on your farms, because all of it is genetically related and all of it is epigenetically related. So we are gonna be talking a lot about epigenetics as well, because that's crucial. There is, you are all aware, there is nothing that is 100% heritable or 100% due to genetics. As a matter of fact, you know, even on the most highly heritable traits, you still have 50% or more of the entire influence on that individual, both its genotype and phenotype, influenced by environment, not direct genetics. So we have to always consider the influence of environment. We call that genotype by environment interaction, or G by E. We've got to always consider the influence of environment on the way that those genetics in any individual express themselves. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're gonna dig deep a little later on in our sessions into epigenetics and, and what that really means. So just, just a little more background. Uh, I was born and raised on my family's farm in South Carolina. Uh, they've been there since 1840. And so I represent the sixth generation. Uh, we were a very diverse farm when I was growing up. Uh, we had, uh, we were in the Piedmont of, of the Carolinas. So we had multiple species of livestock. We had beef cattle, dairy cattle, pigs, uh, chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, uh, pheasants, guineas, and sheep, goats, horses. I, I'm not sure what we didn't have, to be honest with you, but uh, but very diverse. We also, because of where we were located there in the Carolinas, we had a peach orchard, uh, apple orchard, pears, muscadines, and a number of other uh, fruit trees and so forth. We, so we produced a lot of fruit. We, we did some cropping. Historically, uh, they had done a lot of, of cotton production up until the 1930s in my family. And then when the Great Depression hit and cotton market cotton market crash, then they transitioned heavily into livestock and other enterprises. And when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, that, that's what, what I experienced. Um, so we grew some crops, but we also had uh, quite a few acres of, of vegetable gardens. And we ran a general store that was located on one, e one of the edges of the farm <clears throat> and so we, um, we sold much of what we produced on the farm through that general store. So I grew up with that type of experience, 80 plus percent of everything that we ate when I was growing up, we had produced right there on the farm. And we had four active generations uh, on the farm as I was growing up as well. Uh, including my great-grandmother who died in 1990 at 103 years of age. Uh, so uh, I remember when, when I was teaching at the university and particularly in the late 80s and the early 90s when all the, uh, the, the big emphasis on low cholesterol and low fat to no fat and all of these other things was, was really being hammered home to everybody and uh, I, I actually taught the opposite to my students and I teach the opposite today. Uh, we need good fats, we're gonna talk more about that and, and how nutrition plays a role in genetics and the expression of genetics, but, uh, but I taught my students that 
you know, reliance on low-fat diets and statin drugs is a deadly combination. And I think over the last intervening decades, we have seen that to be absolutely the case. But one of the things that I told them was I said, yeah, my great-grandmother, and she died in 1990, and, and I said, uh, yeah, my great-grandmother ate, uh, you know, bacon and pork and you know, beef and eggs and home churn butter and everything else, whole milk, raw milk, all of that from the farm every day of her life. And yeah, that cholesterol finally got her. It, it killed her at 103 years of age. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've, we, we've got a lot of misinformation out there, unfortunately, uh, in a lot of ways. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. We've got a lot of misinformation about genetics out there today, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I fully intended growing up to go away to college, get my bachelor's degree, come back home to the family farm, and spend the rest of my life on the family farm. That was my dream. That was my desire. I was the oldest son, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, went away to Clemson. In my family, that's where you went. You didn't even think about going anywhere else, or you would have been ostracized, but that's where I wanted to go. Uh, so went to Clemson and uh, graduated with my bachelor's degree in animal science. I did go back home to the family farm. But I had this major professor who was very persistent, and <clears throat> he would call me up at least once a month, every month, and make offers for me to come back to grad school. And for a year and a half, I kept refusing him and told him, no, I, I have no desire to do that. I'm happy on the farm. Well, one day he called me up and, and he said, Alan, he said, I, I, I've got a deal for you. And if you turn me down this time, I promise I'll leave you alone and won't bother you again. And he said, if you'll come back to grad school, I'm going to send you down to the Caribbean to an island called St. Croix. You're going to work with a breed of cattle down there called the uh, Cinepole. And uh, do your research, collect your data, all that, come back up to Clemson, do your coursework, and, and get your master's. And, and at that stage of my life, I had never been any further than two hours away from home, either the, going to the east or the west, Myrtle Beach or the Blue Ridge Mountains. That was the sum total of my life experience in terms of travel. And so as a young 20-something, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, the Caribbean. You know, I've only, I'd only seen it on TV and read about it. And, you know, it's supposed to be this incredibly exotic place. So I just said, I had to do that. So, so I took him up on it, went down to St. Croix, experienced quite a bit of culture shock for a country boy from South Carolina. But it was a, a turning point in my life. Um, so I came back up, got my master's, got taught into going on for a PhD at LSU. And, and then at that point, I felt obligated to, uh, to go into academia. So I spent the next 15 years of my life in academia teaching and doing research and extension work. Uh, and at the end of the 15 years, I was a... Uh, tenured full professor, and for anybody that knows anything about academia, you're pretty much there for life at that point. They can't get rid of you unless you do something really, really dumb. Um, so I was fully vested, right? Had all the benefits you could ask for, everything else, uh, retirement and health and disability and on and on and on. But I started recognizing that there were just some things that, that were bothering me quite a bit about what we were doing in academia. And uh, I kept thinking back to growing up on my family's farm and all the things that we didn't need, that we didn't use. We never used any chemicals. We never used any uh, you know, vet meds, uh, feed supplements, anything like that. We, you know, we, we mainly relied on, on what we were doing on the farm to, to produce our fertility and to do the things that we needed to get done. Animals basically died of old age. We didn't have a lot of sickness, a lot of death. And I got to wondering about everything that we were doing in our research 
<clears throat> and thinking about the fact that things were not getting better for farmers and ranchers. As a matter of fact, they were getting steadily worse. You know, their reliance on inputs of all types was steadily increasing. Their, um, their input costs were going up and up. Net margins were coming down dramatically. We had the crisis of the 80s, and we've had ongoing crisis. We've had the last five years in a row. We've had record numbers of bankruptcies filed by farmers and ranchers in the U.S. And in 2020, it's going to be yet another record for number of bankruptcies that are filed, and that's not going to end next year. So all of these things that we were doing in academia, I started to realize really what it amounted to was we, was, we were putting a Band-Aid on a gushing wound. That's what we were doing. We were, in all of our research, we were never really addressing the root cause of our problems. We were just simply addressing the symptoms and trying to treat the symptoms because after all, anytime we can address the symptoms, that's something else that can be developed by a company and sold to you as a farmer or rancher as an input, right? So that's really what was occurring. And I had to make, when I realized that, I had to make a very difficult decision. Do I stay in academia and then retire from that and then try to do something else or do I try to do something else that's more meaningful at that point in time? That was in the year 2000. Our youngest son, our youngest child had just been born uh, that year. And when I came home and told my wife that I was thinking about leaving the university, you know, with that every month steady paycheck, all the benefits, everything else, and we've got a new baby in the house, she looked at me and said, have you lost your ever living mind? What are you thinking? But I, I, I made the decision and I left. Uh, all of my colleagues at the university basically said the same thing as my wife. Uh, they all told me I was an idiot, and why in the world would you leave the university? Um, <clears throat> they said, no way you can make a living, you know, if you leave here. And I thought, wow, we're the ones doing the research, we're the ones teaching, and you're saying, I can't make a living when I leave the university. And uh, how ironic, right? How ironic that my own colleagues would say that. And my department head, do you know what my department head told me? For, he, he, he asked me repeatedly not to leave, but when he saw that my mind was made up and I was leaving, he looked at me square in the eye and he said, Alan, he said, if you, you know if you leave the university, you'll never get hired again by another university. You'll be way too far behind on research and all of that. And I just looked at him and I said, well, and his name was Terry. I said, Terry, here's what I think. I think the university's about 20 years behind. That's what I think. And, uh, and I left. So 20 years later, here we are. We farm and ranch. We do it regeneratively. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more over the next two days about what that means. Uh, we produce a multiplicity of, of species and products. Um, we consult very heavily. Over the intervening 20 years, I've been blessed to have been able to consult with people from 54 different countries so far. Uh, so we've, we've consulted in, in all of the U.S., every one of the U.S. states, all of the Canadian provinces, all across Mexico, Central and South America, and as I said, many other countries. So we're routinely, pretty much on a daily basis, are working with people from, from all over the world and helping them on their farms and ranches and, and in their agricultural enterprises. Um, my partners and I formed a company called Understanding Ag, and that is, of course, that's on my shirt here, but that's our consulting company. We also formed a nonprofit called the Soil Health Academy. And the Soil Health Academy, uh, we teach multi-day, very intense schools, uh, much like this school. 
uh, except that we do half the day in the classroom and we do half the day in the field. So everybody gets some pretty intense field experience as well. And we teach them how to observe. Observation is critically important in what we do. Uh, so, so that sort of synopsis of who I am and, and what we do now, uh, we, again, we, we feel very blessed um, in what we've been able to, to do, the people that we've been able to work with around the world. The one thing that I'll tell you very definitively, folks, y'all are from different places. Okay? We've got Virginia, we've got Wyoming, we've got Dubai, you know, uh, you know, we've Illinois and Missouri. And so, you know, the one thing that I know for sure now is that there are no real differences, guys. Every one of you thinks, and I used to think the same thing, that you're in a very unique location or environment. And it's very different from any other place in the world. And <clears throat> oftentimes we use that as our excuse for why we do or don't do something in the decisions that we make. But the one thing that we have discovered is that soil is soil, microbes are microbes, plants are plants, and animals are animals. No matter where you are in this world, no matter where, and they all work very, very similarly. And if we apply the same basic principles, then they work, again, no matter where you are in this world. Now, how do we know that? Because, again, we've worked in 54 different countries now. And these principles have never failed to work. It's just simply applying them according to your context. So... <clears throat> In September, I turned 60, and I never realized what that milestone meant until I woke up on my birthday, and, and, and you know, then it really hit me when I looked in the mirror what turning 60 means. <laughs> so. All right, so adaptive stewardship is one of the things that we consider to be critically important for sound genetics. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to weave in and out through this adaptive stewardship theme over the course of the next two days so that we better understand why that's so critical in sound genetics. Nature will humble you, and if you refuse to be humbled, nature will defeat you. That's one, the other thing that we got to realize, and I am by professional trade, a geneticist and a reproductive physiologist. Did a ton of research in those areas, and I can tell you very pointedly, because I am a geneticist and reproductive physiologist, some of the things we've tried to do, nature's humbling us on now. We, we push some things too far, and they are coming back to bite us in the butt in a multiplicity of ways. How many of you are familiar with Wendell Berry? Wendell's in his 80s now. He lives on his farm in Kentucky. But he's, he's a world-renowned farmer philosopher, has written a lot of books, uh, has spoken literally all over the world during his lifetime. And I love this quote from Wendell in the New York Times 2018 op-ed where he said, agricultural choices must be made by these inescapable standards the ecological health of the farm, and the economic health of the farmer. And then finally, Masanabu here. Masanabu is sort of like the Wendell Berry of Japan. Uh, he's also in his 80s, but this quote from Masanabu is really, really pertinent to what we're going to be talking about over the next two days. An object seen in isolation from the whole is not the real thing. This is the core mistake we have been making in agricultural, medical, and nutritional research over the last several decades. We have tried to view objects 
in isolation. Our entire research model, the reductionist model, has been set up to view objects in isolation from the whole. And what this has caused is this has caused us to reach very erroneous conclusions, to make very wrong extrapolations, and it has cost us literally billions and billions and billions of dollars in agriculture because of this. So we are going to encourage you over the course of these next two days to not view objects in isolation, but to look at things much more holistically, to look at things from the standpoint of the whole system that we're working with. So the first way that we're going to do that is to look at what I call the historical ecological perspective. No matter how old you are in the room today, not a one of you has experienced anything but an already degraded resource. There's nobody living today on the face of this earth that has ever seen or experienced a fully functional ecosystem. We don't have any of those anymore. All right? So in order to understand what you can build and what things can be like wherever you are, wherever you farm, wherever you ranch, you've got to start looking much further back than your lifetime, than your parents' or your grandparents' lifetime. You have to look back in almost all of North America at least 400 to 500 years to get a real picture of what your landscape used to be and what the potential can be yet again if we just apply the right principles and practices. So that's what we call the historical ecological perspective. And when we talk about that, I'm going to use the southeast as an example. So last week, we did our uh, academy, Soil Health Academy, at BDA Farm in South Central Alabama. Now, if we look at the southeast, what we were taught the southeast was like is very wrong from what the Southeast really was, pre-European settlement. For instance, the Southeast was primarily composed of four types of ecosystems. Prairie, yes, there was a ton of prairie in the Southeast, a whole bunch of it. And it was native North American tall grass prairie the same species that you saw growing in Missouri, in Kansas, in Oklahoma, in Nebraska, and other places were growing in the southeast. Little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, on, on and on and on. Okay? So they all existed there. Illinois, same species there that used to exist in Illinois, in the native tall grass prairie. And what we also have to realize is that the major ruminant species like bison and elk and antelope and deer once existed coast to coast. Okay. 